So we're building superior relationships, which is our next session. This has to do with men and women. What we've done is we've studied the interactions and the chemistry between men and women for a long time. And so we have some ideas that you might be able to use. We say there are six keys to successful, happy relationships. Now, there may be many more keys, but this is about 98, 99% of it. Number one is that similarities attract. And you've heard this before, similarities attract. And what does this mean? It means because of the law of attraction, we're attracted to people who are similar to ourselves in certain specific ways. And the similarities attract in almost all areas, but especially in the area of values. Remember I said that Anne Rand wrote that all love is a response to values. We love another person because they represent the values that we most treasure, that we consider to be the most important. I shouldn't say this, I say this out of school, but sometimes my, my children have asked me, you know, why did you marry Barbara? And I always have one answer. And I say, I married her because of her, char her character. Uh, not that she wasn't a beautiful, attractive, intelligent, wonderful woman, but what I married, because those things will go. A lot of things will go or will change, but I married her because of her character. And I still remember the moment I fell in love with her is when I saw that she had such wonderful character. And that was the most important thing of all. So that's what we're attracted to with another person. We're attracted to values that they seem to espouse. The great disappointment is when they seem to espouse a value and we find out later that they don't actually share that value. That's a real relationship killer. So we have similarities, especially in areas of values, children, attitudes toward children, having children, raising children, and so on. Uh, money is important. Most marriages and relationships break down because of arguments over money. It's the number one killer. Sex, attitudes towards sex. And here's another big discovery, leisure time, is you'll find that people who are ideally compatible uh, really enjoy doing the same things in their leisure time. I've had friends who've gotten married, and she liked to go dancing, and he liked to do stamp collecting. And so she'd go out dancing, and she'd go out partying, and he'd be working at home on a stamp collection. How long do you think the marriage lasted? Not very long. And unfortunately, children come into a marriage, and it's even worse. So you'll find that people who get married like to ski together. They like to go out to dinner together. They, you'll find that couples who are really compatible in 80% of times will order the same dishes. As they'll, they'll, they'll say, times two. You know, <laughs> they look at the menu and they look at everything else and they finally order the same dishes. They'll have the same thing. Um, and they like the same wines and they like the same activities and they like the same movies in general. Uh, so, so what I, I found, and I'll talk about this in just a second. No, I'll come to it in a second. I get ahead of myself. Damn, I get so excited. So, <laughs> so ask yourself, and you look at this in, in terms of values. What are your values? That's the core of your personality. How do you feel about children? Many women make the mistake of marrying a man. He says he doesn't want to have any children. Well, most women want to have children. It's a, it's a biological drive. And they think, well, he'll change. And they get married, and they get stuck into a relationship that lasts for years. And he wasn't kidding. He doesn't want any children. And she does. And sometimes a woman feels that she's wasted her whole product, reproductive life in a situation where she thought he would change, and she thought he would change a basic value. So one of the first things you do is do an interview. <laughs> you know, take them to, to a zoo, see how they treat the other kids. Anyway, uh, money, sex, leisure time. Uh, when you meet the person who is right for you, there will be a chemistry. Uh, Khalil Gibran said, there will be a moment of the meeting of the minds, a, a chemical moment at the first instant of meeting between a man and a woman, or it will never happen. And that's in, in his book, uh, The Prophet, when they ask him, Tell, talk to us uh, of love. And he said, this first answer is, there will be a meeting at the first instant of glance, or it will never happen. And it's quite amazing. People will, their eyes will meet across a crowded room, and they'll be married for the rest of their lives. They may not get married that evening, but they will start to talk to each other and go out with each other and be together forever. And if it's not there, it very seldom comes later. So um, there's always an, almost an, an instant chemistry, and it's very hard to force. That's one thing that you cannot force is the chemistry in a relationship. It feels right because you will be in accord in, on almost all the critical areas of life. And here's an interesting thing that Napoleon Hill said. He said, subconscious minds communicate with other subconscious minds. So you'll meet a person and know nothing about them, but your subconscious minds, your basic values, your core things that you consider important, will communicate in that instant. 
And only later will you find surprise, surprise. This person likes this, and this person believes in that, and this person has the same background, and so on. You never knew any of that. It was just the eyes meeting. And it was the subconsciousness connecting at 30,000 times the speed of the conscious mind. So this often happens. Sometimes you meet a person, you've had an experience, you meet a person, and you even see them, and you just like them, male or female. You just like them immediately. You have an immediate rapport with that person. And sometimes you meet a person, or you see a person, and you immediately dislike them. And later on, you'll find out that that instant feeling was well justified. The person that you instantly liked is a really likable person. The person that you instantly had an aversion to is not a good person. You'll have it instantly, almost in, so fast that you cannot even process it with the conscious mind. Rule is always listen to that gut feeling. Always listen to that intuitive feel that you have for other people. If you ever go against that intuitive feel, then it can be very, very painful and costly, as everybody who's been in business knows. Okay, opposites attract. This is the second principle of relationships, but only in one area, temperament. Nature demands balance. So if there's an outgoing person, they are balanced with an ingoing person. And the way that you can determine this is what is called the talk test. The talk test is everybody likes to talk and everybody likes to listen. So each pe person has a certain need to talk. This is person one and this is person two. And so they have a certain need to talk and a certain need to listen. And there is a, about 10 to 15 percent of comfortable silences when you're together. Now, the, an incompatibility occurs when somebody only likes to talk 15 percent and the other person only likes to talk 15 percent. So there's huge periods of what are called uncomfortable silences. And this, does, this can occur later in a relationship. Have you ever been in a restaurant and seen two people eating and they don't talk? Or you've been driving and there's two people sitting in a car looking straight ahead and they don't talk? This is an, a sign of incompatibility. Or the worst is when they fight for airtime. It's both people like to talk 80% of the time. You two professional speakers get together and you just can't shut them up. So they're always kind of finishing each other's sentence and tripping each other's words. They, can't, they don't listen. They, they cannot talk. So a good relationship is the talk test. It is an easy ebb and flow. It goes back and forth. And you can spend hours in an easy ebb and flow of conversation, subject after subject, with about 10 to 15 percent of comfortable silences. Very just comfortable. Um, number, um, number three is commitment. In a good relationship, there is a total commitment. Uh, there's, there's a thing in relationships called a, um, a trading relationship, where people uh, only commit part way. I'll, do I'll go 50 percent of the way. You go 50 percent of the way. The key to a successful relationship is that you go 100%. And both of you go 100%. The overlap is 100%. Because if both of you go 50%, then all that has to happen is a disagreement, and you, it opens up. It's like a bridge that opens up in the middle, and the relationship can start to collapse. But if you both go 100%, then you can have all kinds of flexibility in the span, if you like, and the relationship is still solid. So total commitment is absolutely important. And, um, and, and that's why if you're not 100% committed to a relationship, then it's not the right thing for you. Uh, fourth, the similar self-concepts uh, attract and are most compatible. What does that mean? It means that people will generally be uh, compatible with people who are about as happy as they are. Now, it's interesting because you, you sometimes feel, find miserable couples. Neither one, they're, both, they're both negative. They both complain all the time. But they're quite compatible. Because they sit there and they complain and grouse and whine and moan and bitch and, and that's just their lifestyle and they watch television, they complain about who's on television and complain about the neighbors. So some people can be happy together even though they're mutually negative. But you'll be, always be most compatible with a person who's about as happy as you are. If you ever try to get involved with a person who's not as happy as you, you're in for a lot of conflict and a lot of problems. Now here's a basic rule, and I've said this before, and the basic rule is people don't change. People don't change their basic self-concepts after they become adults. Now, they may change if there is a significant emotional event. In other words, a miraculous event. Moses does come down from Mount Sinai, and lightning strikes, and the clouds part, and the human being changes, but not bloody <coughs> likely. Uh, so therefore, just accept that if a person does, is not happy, you're not going to make them happy. The rule is that if a happy person marries an unhappy person, the unhappy person will drag the happy person down. The happy person will not bring the unhappy person up. It just ain't going to happen. And many people think, well, I'm happy, so I'll take this person who's attractive and has a lot of good qualities, and I'll make them happy like me. 
It just doesn't happen. That person is miserable. It's almost like they're a sea anchor. They will drown the swimmer. No matter how strong the swimmer is, that anchor will eventually pull them under. And eventually they'll have to walk away. Do you remember that, that line from the movie Network, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore? About 60, 70 percent of divorces in America are initiated by women because they're mad as hell and they're not going to take it anymore. They're just not going to spend the rest of their life in an unhappy relationship. And they just walk. And he's sitting there watching television. He has no idea what's going on. Uh, but they make a decision. He's, he is not going to change. He's quite content being the person that he is. And I'm out of here. And they, in retrospect, they turn back and say it was the best decision they ever made. It takes a lot of courage to do it. Uh, the happiness scale, how happy are you on a scale of 1 to 10? How happy are you on a scale of 1 to 10? And then how happy is the other person? And just make sure that if you're, if you're an 8 in terms of general happiness, make sure that that person's a happy person too. And make sure they're an 8 as well. If you're a 5 or a 10, make sure that they're the same level. Because if they're not, you'll have co continuous conflict. Number five is another, the fifth characteristic is liking. And liking is actually more important than being in love, liking and respect, because being in love can come and go. You can have arguments, you can have fights, you can be really furiously angry and so on. So love can come and go, but as long as the liking and respect there is there, the love will come back. Uh, what is the opposite of love? What is the, what is the opposite of love? Yes, the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. It's just not caring. This is when it's over. I mean, you can hate a person temporarily, as the very fact that you can hate a person means that you uh, feel very strong emotions toward that person. But indifference is where the flame has gone out, the fire is cold, it's gone, you just don't care. And when you reach indifference, it's virtually impossible to save a relationship. When you reach indifference, basically you're just sharing the same roof uh, sharing the same living quarters. And it's very hard to get, uh, it, 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 to, to get the fire going again. It's almost impossible. So liking and respect, these two feelings are more important than being in love because as long as you like and respect the other person, uh, then you can patch it up. Now we have a little problem with uh, Maria and Arnold in California this week. And when Maria found out what Maria found out, this liking and respect went completely. It's gone. You could, you could see this absolutely crystal clear. I mean, it's over, baby. There's no way that we can repair this. Apparently, did you read the latest news? The, ch the, ch the children were born within a short, very sh few days of each other, and the person working for them was pregnant at the same time, and working in the house the same time Maria was pregnant. And here's Arnold, we're back and forth. I wonder what's going through Arnold's mind. Well, I'll tell you, he's got a lot to answer for. But apparently he's worth a lot of money, so Maria's going to be set up quite nicely. In California, you know, we have community property law. That means that everything is divided 50-50 upon divorce. So you say, well, why is it that people go to court and have these fights in court? Well, you go to court to fight over his 50%. See how much the woman can get of that. Because <laughs> her 50% is locked in. Now, how much of his can we get? And that's what, that's what virtually all the custody, all the divorce fights are over, is how much of his you can get. Not only his now, but his in the future. So anyway, Arnold's going to end up paying big time for his indiscretion. Isn't that a good word? His indiscretion. <laughs> so, the, the best friend test is that uh, you're ideally suited to your mate when your, your mate will be your best friend. Could be your best friend in the world. There's no, per, no person that you would rather spend time with. Uh, there's more, more, no person that you'd rather go on vacations with, go out for dinner with, is that everybody else in your life is really peripheral. Your mate is your best friend. And so that's always, you always ask, who's your best friend in the world? Your mate is your best friend. If you have other best friends, I've got best buddies and best girlfriends, and we go on vacations. I know people who go on vacations with their girlfriends, girls, women who go on vacations with their girlfriends, men who go on vacations with their men friends, they don't want to go on vacations with their wife. They just don't like them that much. They love them, you know, but they don't like them that much. So, so best friend is a really, really important thing. What we find is when you meet the right person for you, you know what you turn around and say, I just met my best friend. I just met my best friend. That's the person for me. And that person is there, by the way. That person is out there. Now, communications is another critical factor in relationships. Good communications require time, which I keep talking about. They require a high quality and quantity of time. So a car trip, 
I've mentioned is an opportunity for uninterrupted conversation with your spouse over an extended period of time. A car trip, Barbara and I will sometimes drive to uh, Palm Springs to take a two or three day weekend. And what we'll do is we'll drive all the way there, two and a half to three hours and all the way back, and we will never play anything on the radio. Never play a CD. We'll just use that time because as I mentioned before, the car becomes a cocoon and it fills with conversation. And amazing things come out. And you get to talk about all kinds of things. And, and the longer you're in that car, the more things come out. I've known cases where people are on the verge of getting married, and they took a car trip to visit relatives, three or four hours. By the time they got out of that car, they hated each other's guts. They never got married. I've had friends who are couples, two, husband and wife, and they took a car trip on vacation. By the time they got there, they never wanted to see each other again. Because the car brings out. And it's quite amazing. It's almost like a drug. It's like a truth serum. It brings out what is really in the other person when you drive in a car for a long time. With my kids, and they know this, with my kids, whenever I would drive them anywhere, I would never have anything on. I would just listen to them and ask them questions. Never, or they would listen to me. I remember I was driving with, with David and some of his friends, and I was talking to them about when you grow up, you've got to have goals, and it's really important that you become men of character and everything else. And there's three of his friends, and they're all sitting there quietly. And at the end of it, they all went like this. <laughs> Thank you for the seminar, Mr. Tracy. <laughs> you remember that, Dave? That was really funny. <laughs> From then on, I stopped talking when I was driving with my kids and asked them questions. So. so. <laughs> So number one, men are direct. Number two is women are indirect. And this is very important to understand. Men and women are very, very different in their personalities and temperaments. One of the problems that women have is women can sense things and communicate with women and know what's going on with women without even really asking them. And they assume that men have the same ability and they're just not trying. And the fact is that men are not. If you take a woman's head and you take a screw off the top of the woman's head, you'll find a computer with lights and diodes and them going all over the place. If you take the top off a man's head, you'll see one big block. <laughs> Nothing's happening. There's no lights. There's no, going. When, two, when a man and woman are sitting in front of a television, 80% of a woman's brain is fully functioning. She's thinking about the television. She's thinking about him. She's thinking about life. She's thinking about relationship. She's thinking about her, uh, how big her stomach is. And uh, she's thinking about whether she picked up the groceries. And she's thinking about the friend she spoke to and the phone call she got and the work she has to do. He's just sitting and watching TV. <laughs> dumbest, here's, here's, here's the dumbest question. Actually, it's the second dumbest question a woman can ask a man. Jerry Seinfeld said this. is when, when women say, what, what, what do men think about? And his answer was, not much. Dumbest thing you can say to a man, what are you thinking about? He goes, huh? <laughs> oh, I was just thinking how beautiful you are. He's scrambling. He's, he's like a fish on the dock. <laughs> I mean, thinking of something to say, because he's not thinking about anything. He's just sitting there. He's got nothing, he's got nothing going. He's shut down. You know? And the, here's the worst question. That's the second worst. Tell me what you're really feeling. <laughs> men are like fence posts. They don't feel anything. They're just sitting there. And, and, but they want to give you an answer, so they scramble around in their mind like a person running around opening doors looking for something, trying, trying to give you an answer that will make you happy. Well, I was just feeling about how much I love you. And, uh, <laughs> oh, that's good. I mean, that's what she wanted. <laughs> that, 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 and can I, now can I go back to the television, please? Uh, so, so you have to understand men and women are dif different. Men are direct. They say things directly, and women are indirect. Men are not mind readers, and many women are. Women are often mind readers. Women can pick things up. You know, a man can call home, and he can say, and she'll answer the phone, and he'll say, hi, and she'll say, what's wrong? She could pick up, what's, it's your boss. What did he say? And she'll, she can pick up that there's a problem in his life from a hi or a hello, from a single word. He can walk in looking cheerful as everything else. She'll say, what's the matter? What's wrong? What happened? Well, what, what do you mean what happened? Come on, tell me. How do you know this stuff? Women are, women are human lie detectors. You can't lie to a woman. And if you're going to lie to a woman, even on the phone, she can pick it up. If you're going to lie to a woman, lie on the phone because she can't see your face. That's the only chance you've got of getting past. But even then, it may not work. Sometimes that's why men break up by email. You know, you know, or, or now they're break, breaking up by Twitter. You know, okay, you know that? Because, you, because women, you say, whatever you say, women can pick up the truth absolutely instantly. And so women are really, really sensitive to these things. Men are not. 
Men are very easily bamboozled. Women are brilliant at relationships. Men are not. Women think about relationships all the time. Women, men very seldom think about them. And this is just simply the way the, the human brain is constructed. Uh, so the most common problems in relationships are, first of all, lack of commitment. And a lack of commitment means that you're going part of the way, as we said before. And you can always solve a lack of commitment problem by making a decision you're in 100%, 100%. My friend Charlie Jones says, as far as my wife concerns, divorce, never. Never, 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 never. Murder, perhaps, but not divorce. <laughs> and the thing is, once you've made a decision to be in 100%, it liberates you. I, I was reading an article by a very intelligent woman who said she, she was single during her 20s and she finally got married. It was only after she got married that she realized how exhausting it is to be single, how totally preoccupying it is. Your whole life is consumed with being single when you're single. She said, now that she's married, she's in her 30s, she's got two children, she said, it's quite amazing. It's almost like the first stage of a rocket just fell away. All those crazy days when you were single, when you get married and you're committed to a single person, your life becomes so much simpler. And then all your focus becomes on the future and your children and other things you can do. But when you're married, you are just totally involved in, or when you're single, you're totally involved in being single. Uh, Napoleon Hill uh, once said that no man ever becomes successful until he's married to a good woman. And maybe today it's no woman never becomes successful until she's married to a good man because that frees them to focus on other things in life. They're not preoccupied with being single. Making a commitment is not tying yourself up. It actually liberates you. A total commitment frees you completely from all the confusion of being single. So number two, a lack of commitment is often expressed in a trading relationship where you go halfway, I'll go halfway. And the key to resolving this is for each person to make a 100% commitment to the relationship. The second uh, problem is trying to change the other. What you seize is what you get. Remember Flip Wilson? What you seize is what you get. People don't change, and trying to change another person is a very subtle way. Lack of commitment, by the way, is a subtle way of saying that I'm really not convinced uh, uh, that the, the right person for me, which it means I'm really not convinced that you're good enough. And whenever a person is reminded or suggested that they're not good enough, their self-esteem goes down, they become insecure, they become frustrated. And it's the same thing here. Trying to change the other person is a way of saying that you're simply not satisfactory to me the way you are. So therefore, I want you to do more of this and less of that. I want you to straighten up and fly right. And it's amazing. People at weddings will talk to the bride, and the bride says, well, I'll knock the rough edges off him after we've been married for a while. Or I'll get him to stop doing that, or he'll start doing this. And, and so they go in with this whole idea. And, and they had this idea that you can change people. But here's a, a, an interesting um, model. I call it the iceberg model. And if you, when you look at an iceberg, or you hear about an iceberg, especially in the North Atlantic, um, what you do is you find here's, here's, the, here's the iceberg, but only a small part of the icebergs above the surface. They say 10%, sometimes it's only 5%. It's only a small amount. All the rest of the iceberg is down in the deep ocean currents. And all that iceberg, that iceberg is affected by the currents. The sailors used to be amazed when they would see, we'd be sailing with the wind north, and they'd see an iceberg sailing south against the wind. And it was only later they realized that the deep currents were going south, and that what was going on in the surface was uh, just a little bit of wind. Well, this is a human personality. This is the past of a person, and this is the present of the person. So when you try to change the person, what you're doing is you're working on the tip of the iceberg. But since you cannot change all that history, going back to early childhood, every year of that person's life, all those experiences, beliefs, convictions, fears, doubts, and so on, since you cannot change all that, it's very hard to change a person just by like, pushing on the top of the iceberg. If you cannot change all of that, you probably can't change the person at all. So what you do is you just accept the person completely for who they are, with no, uh, no judgment and no questions. And if there's things that you would wish that that person would do, you can always say, you know, I would appreciate it if you would you know, pick up your socks or put your dishes in the sink or something like that. Men are real quick to respond, by the way. If you ask us to do something, we will. You know, why don't you take the trash out? Well, I didn't know you wanted the trash taken out. Well, the trash bag is sitting there in the living room. I put it in the living room between you and the television so you'd see it. I said, oh, I thought you didn't have any other place to put it. Would you take it out? Of course. And they'll take it out. Would you do this? Of course. 
You ask a man to do anything, they'll do anything you ask them to. But don't say, you know, why don't you, you know, think of it yourself? Are you kidding? They don't think about anything. So, 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 so when you're direct with a man, when you want him to do something or not do something, he'll almost always do it immediately. But you have to ask him. Just the, the most powerful word in the human lexicon is the word ask. Ask for what you want. Ask clearly. Ask repeatedly if necessary. Ask confidently. Ask cheerfully. Ask politely. Ask warmly. But just ask. Men are real suckers for that. You ask us to do it, we'll do it. We'll take out the trash, we'll mow the lawn, we'll pick up the groceries, we'll pick up stuff on the way home. But don't expect us to think about it all by ourselves because we just can't do it. All right, so trying to change the other is a way of saying that you're not good enough the way you are and therefore you need to be whipped into shape. And so sometimes we find if you just stop trying to change a person and just say, you know, would you do this for me or do that for me, they'll, they'll change all by themselves. Sometimes people are proud of the person they've become, and they'll become more adamant when you try to change them. They'll, be, they'll dig in, but they'll also be angry, because what you're telling them is, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough for you. Somehow you're superior to me, that you feel that you can inflict what you think is good for me on me. I mean, it's not a good road to go down. Okay, number three is jealousy. Uh, jealousy is called the green-eyed monster, and it comes from the feeling of low self-esteem. People who feel jealous feel, I'm not good enough. They feel someone else could never really love me. Uh, I'm not good enough. And the way that you deal with jealousy, uh, we say the natural human condition is that of feeling inferior. We, from infancy, have learned to compare ourselves with others. So we're always comparing ourselves with other people. And we're always feeling better or feeling worse. And so in many cases, because we were born as a child, here's what happened, according to the psychiatrist, when we're born as a child, we're really small and our parents are really big and powerful, and they make all decisions, and they know all things. In fact, they have found that a child's attitude toward God is determined by the way their parents treat them. If their father is angry and demanding, then they think God is an angry and demanding and vengeful God. Uh, so if, if, they're, if, they're God, if their father is warm and loving and supportive, they think that's way, the way God is, and they develop that feeling before they can even speak. That becomes their worldview of the, these powerful people. So there was a book written by a mother, a really nice book. It was called Life Among the Giants. And it was about little kids. And what do little kids see? And they look up and they see knees. I mean, and they look up and they see these giants, these huge people who tell them what to do and move them around and pick them up and put them in the car and take them out and lock them in the, in, in the, in the seat and uh, change their diapers and put them to bed. And so a child grows up feeling very small. And these feelings of being small or inferior, being little, pervade throughout life. It's only when the child grows up and has enough emotional sustenance that they feel big and powerful. They feel empowered. But we have a natural tendency to feel little because that's how we were during our formative years. We felt real little. And whenever something happens, like the person that we're interested in seems to express an interest in someone else, we again feel little. We feel inferior. We feel that we're not good enough. Be very alert to this. But most jealousy comes from inside the person experiencing it, not from the external experience. One last point, it is never cute to make a person feel jealous. Sometimes they say, you know, you should flirt with somebody else when you're with him or her, and it'll make them feel jealous, and they'll realize how much they like you. It is never cute to make a person feel jealous because jealousy is extremely painful. Not only that, if a person has real problems with jealousy, it can make them really unhappy, right to the point of violence and mental illness and all kinds of things. So jealousy is something that's a real problem in relationships and try to avoid it. To resolve this, work on your own self-concept by saying, I like myself or I love myself. People who have high self-esteem don't worry about jealousy. They won't worry about these things because they have such confidence in themselves that it doesn't affect them. The behaviors of other people don't affect them. They would prefer not, but they are not bothered by it. And the more you say, I like myself, I like myself, I like myself, the less you experience any negative emotion at all. The next is self-pity. Self-pity is a real killer in our society. Uh, self-pity is rooted in low self-esteem. It's where people pity themselves and see themselves as victims, see themselves as, 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 as hard done by. So the solution for self-pity is to get busy. It is that those who have a worthwhile purpose in life do not experience self-pity. In fact, it's interesting, many of the people who are passionate about causes, about helping others, are actually trying to escape from their own feelings of low self-esteem and insignificance. They're trying to escape from the destructive 
uh, criticism of their childhood, and they're dedicating their lives to helping other people. Because when you throw your whole heart into doing something for other people, you forget all about yourself. So there was a line from Arthur Tennyson when he talked about the death of his friend Arthur Hallam. It's a famous line in poetry. He said, I must lose myself in action lest I wither in despair. And what he was saying is I have to just get so busy that I just don't despair of what has happened to me in my life. And many people who are passionate about helping others are actually trying to escape their own feelings of inferiority, unhappiness, destructive criticism by doing something that helps others and helping them get out of it. One of the fastest ways, they say one of the fastest ways if you're unhappy with your life for any reason is to volunteer to help those who are less fortunate than you. Go to a soup kitchen, go to work at Salvation Army, do something to help other people, and you forget all about your own problems very, very quickly. Um, set clear, specific goals for yourself and work on them every day. The more you're working on your goals and working toward them and feeling like a winner, the more positive you are, the more progress you make. Incompatibility is the biggie. Incompatibility is a real problem. Incompatibility has entered the relationship when three things occur. The first thing that goes in a relationship, number one, is the laughter. The thing that binds people together is a sense of humor. They laugh together. And you'll find that laughter, the ability to make a person laugh, is a form or a foundation of sex appeal. Do you remember the movie uh, Ocean's Eleven? Where there's that conversation, it's a really great conversation at the table, and George Clooney says to um, Julia uh, Roberts, she says, uh, uh, he makes me happy talking about um, casino owner, uh, what's his name, pardon? Andy Garcia, yes. He says he makes you happy, he says he doesn't make me sad. And then he says, and then he says does, but does he make you laugh? And she can't answer, and she walks away. Wasn't well, that a great, great point? He doesn't, does he make you happy? He doesn't make me sad, does, but does he make you laugh? So laughter is the first thing that comes when two people are compatible because laughter is a purely spontaneous expression of happiness. When you're with the right person, you laugh. You laugh all the time, you smile all the time. And when you're in a bad relationship, the first thing goes is, that goes is the laughter. You just stop laughing. You don't find anything particularly funny. Uh, second is the conversation stops, is you stop talking a lot. I cannot tell you how many people I've met over the years who say they go home and they don't talk at night. They go home and they, ch they feed the children, they watch television, they go to bed, they sleep on opposite sides of the bed, and they don't talk. They don't laugh, don't talk. And the relationship has just become almost like a functional relationship, almost roommates rather than, than a married couple. And the third is friendship stops, is you just don't have anything in common with this person. And my rule is that incompatibility is the biggest single problem. And people get really, uh, get their knickers in a knot over incompatibility without realizing that before you get married, you have to go out with a lot of different people to find one person with whom you're compatible in the first place. And if you're not compatible with a person, it doesn't mean that person is a bad person. It just means you're not compatible, no chemistry. We don't get mad at a person because we don't have chemistry. Uh, and it's the same thing. In life, people evolve and change. The biggest time of change in human life is in the 20s. We go through a period of turbulence where we change our ideas and our values and we change our goals and our ambitions. We change our ideas about ourselves. We have experiences and setbacks and failures. By the time a person comes to the 30s, the greatest age for divorce is between 29 and 31. Gail, Gail Sheehy wrote an incredible book some years ago called Passages. And she, what she said is that there are passages at every decade. There are passages through the teens. You go through certain experiences and then you go through a passage and you're in your 20s between 19 and 21, and you go through transitions at that time. Through your 20s, you go through the most rapid transitions, and then from 30, 29 to 31, you go through another transition really into adult life. There are many people today, you read about these kids that live at home and they're 29 years old, frat boys, they hang out, uh, they, they have not even become adults. They're still children hanging out, smoking dope and watching TV in, the kid, in their parents' basements, which is uh, alien to, to, to most of us. But what happens is people grow apart. And I was going to talk to you about compatibility. And what I use is, is the plate model, is when you meet uh, together and, and the relationship is ideal, it'll be like two plates that overlap. You'll have an enormous amount of overlap and a little bit of difference. 
And as the French say, vive la différence. Huh? And so you have these differences, which is what makes a relationship work. What can also happen is that you can meet and two people will have this kind of overlap. They'll be compatible in a few areas. Sometimes they're only compatible physically. Um, so they have a great time physically, and then they get married, and they find they really don't have very much else in common. And then another thing that can happen is that you can be really compatible, but over time you'll grow in different directions. You just grow apart. And these plates, these overlapping plates, slide apart, and the gap opens up. And you really don't have anything in common anymore. And this happens just like the tectonic plates move. It happens like the, like the weather. It just happens. As, as my, my, my teacher, Peter Uspensky, said, he said, when something like this has occurred, just say, things just happen. And there's nobody to blame. There's nobody to get angry at. Nobody goes into a marriage with the intention of it not working. Nobody goes into a relationship with the intention of it not working. So everybody does the best they can with what they have. And so the other thing is it's not personal. If the relationship doesn't work out, it's not personal. It's not a personal attack on either person. If, if people could understand this, and some people do, then they wouldn't have all these terrible, bitter divorces and unhappy breakdowns. People just realize we've reached the point where we're incompatible. And I've spoken to lots of people where the couple just realized, you know, we don't have a lot in common anymore. Why don't we just go our separate ways? And they say, yes, let's do that. Let's, let's, let's sit down with a lawyer who worked for both of us. Let's separate our uh, assets, and let's just go our separate ways and continue you know, to be friends. But we just don't have a lot. We don't have enough to make a marriage. And they do. And they go their separate ways, and they know each other. We had dinner with a couple like that the other day. They've just been good friends for the rest of their lives. But they're not angry with each other, and there's no bitterness or no rancor, and there's no lawyers getting all the money in the divorce suit. I tell you what, some real happy lawyers looking at uh, Maria and, uh, and Arnold and hoping they can be first in line because the lawyers will end up with millions of dollars if they can get them to fight. You've got to get them to fight. You've got to get them spitting mad and fighting each other, and that really cranks up the legal bills. Okay, so if incompatibility has happened, accept it as a reality. Accept it as a reality. Don't fight it. Don't be angry about it. Just it has happened. Just like it rains, life happens, things happen. So if incompatibility has happened, no one is guilty. This is the hardest thing for people to believe in our Judeo-Christian society. We are brought up to believe that if something is wrong, some if something is wrong, someone is wrong. If something has gone wrong, someone is guilty. And so it's always a witch hunt. If something goes wrong, who is to blame? And you know what most arguments in divorce court are? Fights over how much blame each one is going to take because that's going to determine how much money each one gets. So the whole fight is over. who's to blame. Big problem with Maria and Arnold, uh, by the way, is it's too black and white. Is Arnold's in big trouble here. There's not a single member of a single jury anywhere that's going to find for Arnold, especially with women on it. <laughs> Jeez, he's got a chance. So, so the most important thing in relationships is to realize that you do everything possible to make a relationship work, and if the relationship doesn't work, then you have the maturity to say, I am responsible for my reactions, no one is guilty, and then just have the courage to go your separate ways. In the meantime, if you make a total commitment and spend lots of face-to-face -face time and communicate well with each other uh, and put your whole heart into the marriage, then chances are your marriage will go on and on and on. And if it doesn't work out, by the way, it's probably the best thing for both parties. There's a, there's a line from uh, Christopher Marlowe, the English poet. He said, when the false gods go, in other words, the bad marriage or relationship, when the false gods go, the true gods arrive. So when the bad relationship goes, the real great relationship arrives. They say in the paper yes, this week, it said 50% of first marriages in America end in divorce. But 70 to 80% of second marriages, they stayed married for the rest of their lives. So, uh, so don't worry about it. All right, let's take 10, 15 minutes and come back. And let's take 10 minutes and come back and carry on. We've got something great for you. We've got a great experience for you. Many years ago, there was a seminar called EST. Do you remember EST? Yeah. And um, EST was a very interesting confrontational seminar. But you know, the final essence, I never attended it, but I know people who did. The final ending of EST was you are responsible. You know, you, you're who you are and what you are because of yourself. You don't like it changed. That was basically us. And people were going, Woo! what an incredible concept. Um, and it was an outrageously successful seminar. The pe person who put it together, together, Werner Erhardt, actually took most of his work from Uspensky and Gorchev, which is uh, an underlying series of ideas from here. You've heard of Eckhart Tolle? Eckhart Tolle, all of his work comes from Uspensky and Gorchev. 
And when you take all the work from a particular person, that's the one person you never mention in any of your materials. But you could see, when I, and I, I like, I like, I've read Eckhart Tolle's books, and I like them very much, but you see it just, the thread that runs through it is Uspensky and Gurdjieff, and they taught the principles we've been teaching today about clearing your mind, about accepting responsibility, about different levels of energy, of, of, of the elimination of negative emotions as being the, literally the key that opens your future, which requires positive thinking, forgiveness, positive expectations, high self-esteem. I have added in all the modern psychology, but some of these key principles are from Gorcha. Anyway, the reason I mentioned uh, Est was because what they do at the end of Est, which has caused it to be successful, is they would say to everybody, are you, in, are you people of high integrity? And everybody would say, yes, yes, yes. He said, well, if you are truly of high integrity, then you will bring more people to this seminar, more paying guests to this seminar. If you don't, it means that you're a liar, you have no integrity, you suck, everything you say is untrue, you have no future, you're a worthless worm, you're ugly, unless you bring people to this seminar. And so people would run out and bring their friends and literally become pests. And I think, was it Lifestream? There's, there's another, pardon? Lifespring. Lifespring. That was the same pitch as well. I mean, that if you uh, really believed in these sort of things, then you will bring other people to the seminar to pay. Well, now I want to talk about this seminar. <laughs> and what I would like you to do, at the end of the seminar, there's an evaluation form where you um, will just give us your feelings and opinions, what you like most, what you like least, what recommendations you have, so you can help us to improve the seminar over time. And what I really would appreciate is if you know people who would enjoy this seminar, please encourage them to attend the next seminar. I'd really appreciate that. Um, but there's no, none of that other stuff, <laughs> okay? I would just thank you. The other thing I wanted to mention is that um, you all have the CD uh, at your desk. Did everybody get that? We put them on your chairs. And those are wonderful things. At any given time when you're stressed, now it's very important you try to do this when, with an empty stomach and not after drinking. Don't come home and have a glass of wine and then try to use this. It doesn't work. The wine just kind of fragments your, your, your hard drive. So when you come home in the evening, just sit down quietly or on the weekend in an afternoon, just sit, sit down quietly and it has an enormous calming influence and over time it actually has a cumulative influence. So you reach the point where you can just close your eyes and just go into a deep state of relaxation for a few minutes. And there's an enormous amount of research now that is coming out that shows that regular re relaxation, meditation, where you close your eyes and relax, taped uh, meditation by playing the CD, these have uh, enormously good effects on in increasing creativity, uh, improving uh, your health, uh, lowering your flashpoint, so doing this on a regular basis, I know some people who've gone literally from rags to riches and they attribute a lot of it to daily meditation. So whenever you feel yourself stressed for any reason, just sit quietly and just listen to this. Put it onto your iPod, carry it around with you, just listen to it. You can listen to it in a plane, you can listen to it in your car, you can do almost anything with it. In about 20 minutes, it'll take you right down, right up, and you just feel really happy, almost like you just had a, a wonderful mental or emotional massage. Now, the, the, the last thing I want to tell you about, let's see, I think we got this. Oh, yes. Um, if, you would, if, you, if you like this seminar and you'd like to give us a testimonial, please do so. Please stand in front of the camera over here and speak to someone who may be thinking of attending this seminar and say, if you're thinking of attending, just say whatever you, you actually feel. Uh, and that will be helpful to us because the most, one of the most powerful ways of encouraging other people to attend is for them to hear you speaking and you experience saying how much you enjoyed the seminar. And what we'll do is we'll make you a star. We'll put you on the video. We'll send you out to hundreds of thousands of people. No payment, of course. Um, <laughs> and the last thing is people have asked us about our Total Business Mastery Seminar. Our Total Business Mastery Seminar is a three-day intensive roundtable workshop with other business owners. And we've talked about this. It's other business owners. So if you're a business owner, if you've been in business for three to five years, if you're earning more than $100,000 a year, then please pick up this form. It's on September 16 and 17, 16, 16, 17, 18, and it will be here in San Diego, either in this hotel or a nearby hotel. And if you're in business, this literally blows your mind. The seminar is like a crash practical MBA program in two and a half days. Starts Friday at noon and goes through all day Saturday and Sunday. 
We had two people in our last seminar in this room, and we only learned later. One woman uh, was on the verge, she had a business and the, was on the verge of bankruptcy. She came to the seminar, she scraped up her last few dollars, she said, this is my last chance. I'll go to this seminar and they guarantee it, so if I'm not happy I can have my money back, which we guarantee everything. And she came and uh, about, just about six weeks later, someone from our office was talking to her. She said she went back into her business and she had come here to learn some things and go back and close down. She drove her sales up 35%. She got out of debt. She turned her business around. She said it was transformational, those basic business concepts that she did not have. Another man had a business that had been in his family for 40 years, and it was a ship, uh, ship repair building business here. And I spoke to him a couple of times. I said, how's business? Oh, yeah, business is okay. Well, it turned out his business was on the verge of bankruptcy as well, and he was the son of the founder of the company. He was, he's about 35, 40 years old. But he was really concerned about having to shut down the business because uh, it had been in the family for so long. He, drove, he increased his sales 42% the following 30 days after going through that seminar and turned his business around, turned the whole staff around just with the concepts that we teach. So if you are a business owner and you've been in business three to five years and you're earning more than, well, say, say $50,000, $100,000 a year, please come to that seminar. It's 1997. Uh, for you, and you can bring one person with that $1,997 and it includes all materials. So I just, that's the end of my commercial. If you'd like some more information, you're probably going to hear from us anyway, because we know where you live. <laughs> all right.